Welcome to the American Maritime Podcast. I'm Mike Roberts, your host. I'm very honored uh, to be joined today by Ambassador Robert O'Brien, who succeeded John Bolton to serve as President Trump's National Security Advisor from September uh, 2019 until the change of administrations this past January. A lot of life happened in those 16 months, uh, as Ambassador O'Brien was a key player in some of the most important successes of the past administration, including the Abraham Accords, which normalized relations between Israel and the United Arab Emirates and three more Arab countries uh, afterwards, and a separate agreement normalizing economic relations between Serbia and Kosovo. Ambassador O'Brien's major focus, however, has been on China and the urgent need uh, to develop an effective policy to address China's global ambitions. And given Ambassador O'Brien's very strong expertise and interest in maritime, we are delighted to have him join us today. Before joining the administration, a Ambassador O'Brien was a, uh, a partner with a leading law firm in California and a major in the Army JAG Corps Reserve. Ambassador O'Brien, thank you for your service, and we are delighted to have you with us today. Thank you, Mike. Great to be with you. Good. Now, we began this uh, podcast with a, a video clip from a speech that you gave last year. Uh, and and uh, it, in that clip, it, it, it asserts that our broad support for China, our being America's broad support for China, going back um, 25, 30 years, is on the assumption that it would uh, liberalize uh, and democratize uh, w as its economy grew. And, and the assertion is that that uh, assumption was a miscalculation that was the greatest failure of American uh, foreign policy since the 1930s. As China grew richer and stronger, we believe that the Chinese Communist Party would liberalize and meet the rising democratic aspirations of its people. Now, this was a bold and quintessentially American idea. It was born of our innate optimism and by the experience of our triumph over Soviet communism. Unfortunately, it turned out to be very naive. We could not have been more wrong. And this miscalculation was the greatest failure of American foreign policy since the 1930s. Now, coming from the National Security Advisor to the President, that's a pretty dramatic uh, claim. And, and can you elaborate on what, what you meant there? Sure. And, and again, it's great to be here with you, Mike. The, the, the real issue that we faced with China is that we didn't pay attention to the Chinese. We didn't pay attention to what they wrote. Uh, we didn't pay attention to what they said. The, the Chinese Communist Party made it very clear that uh, they were a, a Marxist-Leninist uh, organization, that they were going to have total control of China, that China would be the, uh, eventually become the center of, of the uh, universe, uh, or at least the, uh, of this planet, that, and that we'd all end up uh, in some sort of tributary status uh, to, to Beijing. And, and I think that folks dismissed that uh, naively, uh, assumed it was just uh, uh, old ideologues talking, and, and yet China has, uh, has very much lived up to its uh, its words. It's published in Xi Jinping Thought. Uh, after I gave my speech, there was very little criticism of what I said about Chinese ideology from the Chinese or from their mouthpieces because uh, you know, it was well footnoted and then I was basically repeating what the Chinese themselves have said. So uh, we were naive. Uh, we didn't pay attention to what they were saying. Uh, we assumed that they would become uh, wealthier and, and more liberal and more like us. And, and, that, and that just hasn't happened. They've become more author authoritarian. Uh, they've got a total surveillance society. They've, they're trying to extend that uh, beyond China's own borders and, and shut down speech by American uh, academics, individuals, uh, the GM of the, the Houston Rockets. And so uh, they've got uh, global ambition and uh, global reach, and, and, and we didn't pay attention. And we're starting to wake up to it. And I think a bipartisan consensus is forming. And I think it's one of the great accomplishments of the Trump administration was to uh, reawaken America to the the challenges that we face from from the Chinese Communist Party. In that regard, your speech was the first of, if I'm correct, four uh, speeches given by senior national security uh, advisors in the last administration, the, the national security team. Can you talk a little bit about those four speeches? No, th thanks. And and I'd encourage people, I think you can still go to the, uh, the Trump White House archives, uh, .gov, and, and look on 
Uh, there's a book called Trump on China, Putting America First, which is a, a compilation of those speeches, a couple of speeches from the president, one from Vice President Pence and, and one from uh, Matt Pottinger. And I'd encourage people to go on and, and either download the PDF or, or order a copy of the pamphlet. Uh, it was unprecedented. Uh, I got together with Secretary Pompeo and Attorney General Barr and, and FBI Director Ray, and we, we sat around Mike's desk at the, uh, in his office at the State Department. And we, we really felt that we needed to get the word out to the American people. And, and each one of us took a different approach uh, and, and talked about the, the dangers of, of what we're facing with the rising and more aggressive China. And we gave those series, that, uh, series of, of four speeches over the summer. And, and I think it had a real impact on, on the American people and also on uh, leadership in Washington. I spoke about Communist Party ideology. Uh, Christopher Ray talked about the massive theft of American wealth by China, that uh, the theft of intellectual property by the Chinese is the greatest wealth transfer in human history. And it's when you think about it, when the Chinese steal the, the, the patented know-how or the technology of uh, an American company, not only did they deprive that company of license fees and patent fees and, and sales, uh, they often use that uh, to create cheaper goods, uh, competing goods in China, and then subsidize those and dump them in the U.S. and put the original American innovator and, and manufacturer out of business. So it, it's, you know, not, not only are, are they damaged by the, the lack of, of revenue for their know-how and their invention, but then they're put out of business because their, their very invention and know-how is, is dumped back in the United States at a lower cost. And so it's been a massive problem. It's, it's really hurt our industrial base. It's, it's taken trillions of dollars out of the U.S. economy and shifted it to China. And, and China, in turn, has used that to, to build up one of the greatest militaries in, in human history. So uh, that, that's been a problem. Uh, Bill Barr talked about the, the threat to national security. And, and Secretary Pompeo talked about the overall context of, of China's rise and, and the, the danger that creates for the United States and our allies. So uh, I thought it was a powerful set of speeches. And I, I think uh, it really moved the needle in the way that the American public uh, viewed the challenge coming from the PRC. Well, I think that awareness and that recognition that we have an issue is is uh, certainly the starting point uh, in in changing U.S. policy and, and responding effectively to all of this. So, uh, we really appreciate the uh, the the organization and and those speeches. I think we're all, as you say, I think they're very effective in uh, in in resetting and and bringing an awakening to um, uh, to this issue in the American public. I would say. Uh, as far as the American maritime is concerned, uh, this is a fairly new issue for us uh, uh, and a very significant, significant issue. We're trying uh, to treat it that way as, as a very important issue. And we've had some, some guests on previously in these podcasts, uh, Admiral Stavridis, um, uh, uh, the Hudson Institute's Brian Clark and Tim Walton. And uh, we expect to have or hope to have uh, uh, Dr. Michael Pillsbury on soon and others. And, and generally speaking, we're talking about China. It's, it's, a, it's just that important to this industry as, as, as well as the country at large. So um, well, that, that, that's a terrific, Mike, that's a terrific lineup. I mean, each one of those uh, men is, a, uh, is an absolute expert. And, and I, I've relied on all of their opinions uh, you know, over my time in office. So great, great lineup for your your podcast. We've been very, very fortunate uh, to have those conversations. Let me ask you, uh, and I think I know the answer here, but is this a partisan issue? Is it Republican, Democrat uh, issue? No, I, I really don't think it is. I think this is a nonpartisan or a bipartisan issue. And, and we live in a very polarized political time now, as, as you know, and your listeners and viewers know. Uh, but this is one area where I think Americans are coming together to face the threat. So I think that we, we move the ball uh, uh, a long way forward down the field, and, uh, and I'm hopeful, and, and, and early signs appear, that, you know, appear to be that the Biden administration is, is picking up where we left off. So one of the things that we did that was, we felt was very important was rejuvenate the, the partnership that we call the Quad, and that's the relationship between the United States, Japan, India, and Australia. Uh, we, we moved it further. We had uh, head of state uh, level meetings. We had uh, meetings at the national security advisor level, at the, at the foreign minister, secretary of state level. And, and we're starting to see that happen uh, with the Biden administration. And that's going to be one of the ways that we can push back on China, that we can protect our sovereignty, protect our liberty, uh, 
is by working together with like-minded friends and allies, and, and certainly with India, the world's largest democracy, which has a population that rivals China, with Japan, the, their cutting-edge technology and, uh, uh, and, and tradition of, uh, uh, of military daring do and, uh, and competence, and, uh, and then, of course, Australia, which is with us at our side anytime we're ever engaged uh, diplomatically or, or militarily. It's an extraordinarily powerful uh, a grouping of countries, and that's something that the Biden administration has uh, uh, has followed up on. So we're, we're pleased to see that. The other areas in, in supply chain, I think we found out with COVID-19 how dangerously reliant we were on China for, for basic medical uh, uh, equipment, pharmaceuticals, pharmaceutical precursors, PPE and the like, uh, not, not to mention chips and, and manufactured goods. And so I think what's happened is around the world, countries have recognized that they need trusted providers. They either need to move their supply chains home or they need to nearshore them if it's, if it's impracticable to, to bring the supply chain home, to, to bring them to neighbors. And we see Japan doing that. We see Japan moving uh, manufacturing out of China and either back to the home islands of Japan or to the Philippines or Vietnam. Uh, we're seeing American companies looking at Latin America, Mexico, uh, Central America, uh, Colombia, Brazil, uh, and, uh, and and looking to make sure that we, in the event of a crisis, that we still have access to the products we need and to the and, and to the supply chains we need that are coming from trusted providers. And so I think that's that's something the Biden administration is also uh, uh, working hard on. So so it's good to see that the, that President Trump's legacy is uh, is in place and intact. And and I compliment the uh, uh, the Biden administration, especially when it comes to some of these China issues. Uh, for doing the right thing and and, and making sure we're, we're putting America first. Well, I want to fo follow up on your comments around nearshoring. I think it's a, it's a very important issue, and I, and I do want to follow up in a minute on that. I, before we do, I'd like to just get it sort of level set a little bit in terms of uh, the maritime uh, uh, aspect of this, and particularly the, uh, the uh, China's maritime posture. Uh, and that's first from a military perspective, uh, and, and to the extent you can uh, share uh, information on this, but you know, for the Navy, the Coast Guard, the mil maritime militia, uh, how would you compare uh, U.S. and Chinese naval forces today versus, say, 10 years ago? What would the differences, what would you see? Well, it's been a dramatic difference because the, the Chinese have engaged in a maritime buildup that we haven't seen since Kaiser Wilhelm built the Kriegsmarine prior to, uh, to World War I. And I think the, the Chinese have far exceeded what, what the Germans did when they were trying to challenge the United Kingdom at, at, uh, in, in Britain at sea. So uh, we've seen a massive buildup uh, uh, on the maritime front and the Blue Water Navy front. Uh, this blue militia that the uh, the Chinese use are these massive fishing massive massive fishing boats themselves, but then massive groupings of the the, the boats, uh, and using those to go secure geopolitical ends in the South China Sea and otherwise, or even off the coast of uh, of Latin America. Uh, we're, but we're we're also seeing a, a tremendous buildup in uh, aircraft for the the PLA Air Force. Uh, we're seeing a, a buildup of the Coast Guard, where the the Chinese are fielding Coast Guard ships that are. That are almost as big as destroyers. Uh, we're, we're seeing the, the Chinese military itself build up, and then we're seeing their, their strategic rocket forces, uh, both the, uh, for on the, the strategic level, on the nuclear level, but also on the conventional level, uh, with hypersonic weapons uh, and massive numbers of missiles being produced by the Chinese. So it's a it, it's a very credible force that they they built. It's a very large force, and the, you know I think we still have a qualitative edge, but. Uh, uh, certainly, the Chinese have a quantitative edge, and as Stalin used to say, you know, quantity has a quality all of its own, and uh, <laughs> and we're we're getting outnumbered and outgunned in the uh, in the Indo-Pacific, and, and we need to change that. Yeah, I mean, ten years ago, we would have there wouldn't have been anything like that, right? We my oh, my recollection is we would sort no. of shrug about the, the the capabilities that the Chinese had. Now, the, the Chinese have gone from a green water navy to a blue water navy faster than than any of the experts expected. Yeah. Uh, and they've, they've done so quite capably. I mean, you have to give them credit for that. Uh, they've had a lot of money. They've invested a lot of money. They're, they're hardworking. They're smart. And, uh, and they, they, they've changed the calculus in the Indo-Pacific. There's no question about it. Now, fortunately, we've got uh, the, the greatest Navy in, in the history of the world and uh, tremendous sailors and, and Marines and our, and our Naval Service. And, uh, you know, we, we still have a big edge when it comes to aircraft carriers. But part of, of our problem is, is that we have global responsibilities, whereas the Chinese can really focus in, within the Indo-Pacific theater. So mm -hmm. while our capabilities are, are, are impressive, they're, you know, they're spread across the entire world, 
and uh, and so in the specific Indo-Pacific where we're facing off against a, a, you know this impressive new Chinese Navy, uh, it's a you know it, they're they're giving into in the Indo-PACOM uh, command uh, you know a, a handful. Yeah, the National Defense Strategy of 2018 identified near-peer adversaries as a key threat to America for the first time since the Soviet Cold War. Can you talk about how an expanded Navy fleet, an Arctic strategy, and other investments in our maritime military capabilities would help us succeed to counter that threat? Now, that's another great question, Mike. I mean, look, here, here's the, the short answer to that. Peace through strength. It works. It's worked since Roman times. Uh, it, it certainly worked when President Reagan uh, made that, that phrase popular again back in the 80s when we were facing a uh, Soviet Union that was on the move. Uh, Weakness is provocative, and when our adversaries determine that we're weak, and that's my biggest concern with the, the Chinese, and you've seen them acting very aggressively, the, the disrespectful tone with which they addressed uh, uh, Jake Sullivan and Tony Blinken in, in Anchorage and, and, and basically taking the position that America is irre irreversibly in decline and that China's on the ascendancy and, uh, and they're going to tell us you know, how it goes. And you know, if they, they, they want to commit genocide, they'll commit genocide and don't want to hear about it from us. Uh, they, they've become uh, very aggressive. And I think it's because they view us as, as, as being weak. And we, we've got to dispel that because there'll be a miscalculation. The United States isn't weak. Uh, we're a strong nation. We remain a strong nation. We remain a strong nation for, for many, many years into the future. Uh, but, but we don't want our adversaries to, to miscalculate. And, and I'm afraid there's, there's some worry about that. So but the best way to, to avoid that sort of miscalculation that can lead to war uh, or lead to a crisis is to to demonstrate, not just to talk, but to, to walk the walk, not talk the talk. And that means rebuilding our Navy. We need to get to 355 ships. At the end of the administration, we, we presented a plan to do so and, and do so within a relatively uh, tight budget. Uh, we need to keep uh, readiness uh, at the forefront. We can't go back to the, the days of sequestration under the Obama administration when our military was decimated. And you know we need to we need to when you talk about the Arctic it's it's the Antarctic and the Arctic we need to have presence there so we were working on leasing a couple of icebreakers uh, to bolster our fleet at the end of the Trump administration I hope that's something the Biden administration will continue with uh, but we need to be present we need to be present in the Arctic present in the Antarctic and, and then we've got to have a navy a, a fleet that's big enough uh, to deter the the Chinese and and let them understand that if they they ever did uh, in, engage in, in uh, uh, belligerency with the United States, our friends, our partners, our allies, uh, that they'd come out on the losing end. And that's that's the best way to deter, deter a, a fight is to, to be so strong that, that no nation wants to you know, tempt us. Mm -hmm. uh, this December, this past December, the uh, Navy uh, issued a 30-year uh, shipbuilding plan uh, covered many different platforms. And I think this you know, ties into your, your, your last response. Uh, uh, if fully implemented, this uh, would provide uh, key naval assets and help position our shipbuilding industrial base to meet those challenges. What's needed for that to happen? Well, we, we, we've got to fund the Navy and we, we've got to make sure that the, the, the 355 plus ship Navy and you know you add to that uh, some unmanned vessels uh, that can be built in some, some of the smaller shipyards. Uh, we need to make sure that's funded and that it's funded on a long-term basis so that our private sector shipbuilders want to get into the business of building warships for the Navy, uh, you know, from, from you know the smaller unmanned uh, ships through the uh, uh, patrol boats and frigates, and uh, uh, all, all the way up to the aircraft carriers. And so, there has to be a, a commitment. It has to be a long-term commitment, so that that industry is willing to make the investments necessary uh, to, to to build those ships and to, to uh, maintain the shipyards. I mean, one of the travesties uh, in the United States is that. Our shipbuilding capability has shrunk dramatically over the past 30 or 40 years. Um, we just don't have enough shipyards. Uh, I've visited many of them. I've been up to Portsmouth, I've been to Bath, I've been to, uh, to Marinette, Wisconsin, and uh, we've got great workers, we've got great shipyards, but we don't have enough of them. And uh, we need more. And, and, and the way that we, we get more is, is by having a commitment to a Navy that's sufficiently large and strong to defend our interests abroad. To deter our foes and, and reassure our allies, uh, and and that will encourage our private sector uh, uh, defense companies to and, and, and maritime companies uh, to keep the shipyards going and, and invest in them and expand them and uh, 
and be in a position to, uh, to, to build out the fleet that we need. And, and by the way, there's a, a, a great commercial uh, aspect to that as well, because the same shipyards can, uh, when they're busy and when they have the, the, the skill sets and when they're properly supported by the rest of the defense and industrial base, uh, which has become relatively fragile, as you know, Mike, right. uh, you know, th then we can start building commercial ships and start competing actively there as well. That's that's uh, uh, that's great. It, all of the investment. I'm going to shift to China for just a second there. All of China's investments in its navy and and other military mar maritime assets are in addition to other areas of offensive weapons uh, development, cyber, air force, space, etc. And you mentioned this earlier. Uh, yeah. What are the consequences of China's military buildup? And I'm referencing now a book by Admiral Stavridis that came out about a month ago, 2034. It's a, sort of a Tom Clancy kind of a n novel uh, that envisions an escalating conflict with China uh, with devastating consequences. Is that a possibility? Is that where we might be headed? Look, there, there, there have been a number of those type of books. I, I haven't read uh, Admiral Stavridis' book yet. I'm, I'm looking forward to doing so. There was a, a a similar book that came out a couple of years ago called Ghost Fleet. Right. Uh, and then Jim Kraska wrote a, an article about the, uh, uh, probably 15 years ago, about the, the carrier war of uh, uh, 2015. That was a long novel or a, a long uh, article uh, in a peer reviewed journal uh, that, that anticipated what could have happened in a, in a conflict with China. So uh, folks are starting to take a look at these issues. We're wargaming them like crazy at, at the Pentagon. and. Uh, and other agencies to try and figure out how do we stack up against the Chinese? How do we deter them? And, and if, if the Chinese decide to engage in offensive military action against the United States, how do we defeat China? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, it, it's a real concern because as I mentioned before, the Chinese are capable, they're hardworking, they're smart, and they've, uh, they've put a lot of money into their, uh, uh, their military and naval services. So we, we need to uh, you know, keep an eye on what they're doing and we need to, to, to match them now. The, the great advantage we have over the Chinese is we have terrific allies. And uh, when you take a look at Japan, when you look at the Five Eyes, uh, New Zealand, Australia, UK, Canada, and, and the United States, when you look at India and the, the strong relationship that President Trump and President Modi had, and, and hopefully President Biden and, and President Modi will have a, a similar relationship. When you start stacking up those alliances together, that's, a, that's an advantage that, uh, that many people don't realize that we bring the fight. and. Uh, so it's important that we stay close with our allies and work with them to counter this Chinese threat. Okay, great. I want to shift, if I can, uh, and discuss this China relationship from a commercial spec, uh, perspective. Uh, one reality of the uh, U.S.-Soviet uh, um, Cold War was the nearly complete absence of any economic ties between our two countries when the, the grain deal, where U.S. grain was being sold to, to the Soviet Union, that was a big deal at the time. Obviously, that's not the case today uh, in the relationship between uh, the U.S. and China. And I'll ask you a very broad question here, and you can answer it uh, as you will. But uh, how would you characterize uh, U.S. Uh, economic policy versus Chinese uh, economic policy? Well, the, the Chinese have a, a program called China 2025 in which they, they want to control you know, all of the important technologies in the world in China uh, they want to manufacture in China, and they want to be the, 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 the supermarket of the world for all advanced technologies, so that the entire world is dependent on China. Uh, we don't think it's a good idea. I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think the, our administration felt it was a good idea for us to be totally dependent on China uh, for the most important technologies and the most important products in the world. So we need to make sure that we, uh, we don't allow this kind of mercantilist uh, uh, play that the Chinese are making. Uh, using all sorts of different resources, whether whether it's uh, theft of trade secrets and intellectual property, uh, government subsidies, which are, are massive for favorite industries, uh, industrial policy, all the things that we see China doing to attempt to achieve a dominant position in the economy. We need to make sure that we protect uh, free markets and, uh, and, and free men and our, our manufacturers here. So we're going to have to do some things that maybe you wouldn't in a, in a classical free market sense do, but we're going to have to to have some industrial policy ourselves and, and protect key industries here uh, to make sure that they're not offshore and that we don't, uh, uh, and that they're not put out of business by currency manipulation, by dumping, by subsidies uh, taking place in China. So, you know, that A, that's very important that we don't, we don't cede the playing field when it comes to, to manufacturing to the, uh, the Chinese. But look, we do have uh, strong relations, economic relations with China. We, we buy a lot from China. We sell a lot to China. 
Uh, but we need to make sure that, that our policy isn't overly influenced by companies that are selling to China or Wall Street companies that are that are betting on on big returns from uh, investment deals with, with China or, or, or representing China in financial transactions. We need to be very careful about how we, uh, you know, how we move forward. We should definitely have commerce with China, but we need to do it in a, in a fashion that doesn't compromise our national security. So it, you talked about industrial policy, the industrial strategy that China is pursuing, which is not basically not the, the American way. It's, it's, it's not consistent with free market economics, but China puts its thumb on the scale yeah, for certain sectors and, and uh, in order to develop those sectors more effectively. Um, uh, and we've seen that industrial strategy uh, come into play when it comes to maritime, the maritime industry, shipping and shipbuilding. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But is there, a, my question now, is there a connection between those favored industries in China and their global geopolitical global ambitions? Oh, a hundred percent, Mike. And you, you mentioned shipbuilding. When you think about it, I think the Chinese have probably spent 120 to 150 billion over the last 10 years to subsidize their shipbuilding. Uh, they build, uh, you know, thousands of, of ships, all, all types of cargo ships, trawl, fishing trawlers, uh, in addition to their naval forces. And, and that, that would give them a tremendous advantage in, in, in the event of a conflict or or, or even in peacetime competition, that if there, if there are thousands of Chinese vessels plying the the seas and uh, and delivering goods and 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 seeing ports and and having situational awareness uh, of the the global commons the uh, of the seas uh, that's a tremendous advantage for the Chinese. We have far fewer ships uh, uh, at sea, unfortunately. We've got great seamen. We've got great merchantmen and women. Uh, we train them well, uh, but we need to uh, we need to increase the uh, the number of American ships that are out uh, you know plying the. Uh, the, the, their their uh, their goods around the, the the world the way that we used to and and look in, in the event of a conflict or a crisis we rely on the U.S. merchant marine to move uh, ships and stores and ammunition and, and material and and soldiers sailors airmen and marines where they need to go and so uh, the the smaller our fleet gets our commercial fleet gets our merchant fleet gets and the the larger the Chinese gets, that, that just becomes another national security nightmare that we have to solve for and, and, and figure out how to deal with in the event of a crisis. So we need, we need to make sure that we have a strong U.S. maritime industry. There's no question about it. Let me, <clears throat> excuse me, you mentioned a couple of uh, uh, data points and let me just, so uh, there was a study by the CSIS that came out last year that indicated uh, the, uh, the Chinese are investing the Chinese government is investing roughly $15 billion annually in, in Chinese shipping and shipbuilding industries. Um, and, um, and, and that, and, and it may or may not come as a surprise to you, but that's roughly 30 times what the U.S. government invests in our commercial shipping and shipbuilding industries. Um, uh, and our policies were uh, set, uh, uh, you know, at a time when we assumed that we were we were the only global superpower. Uh, it, it, it strikes me, and I, and I appreciate your reaction, that we have to reset our, our fundamental policies in light of this of this new threat. No, 100 percent. And look, one of the things I'd look at, we have a, you know, 15 billion is a lot of money. There's, there's no question about it. But I I think there's a currently a, a one point five trillion dollar infrastructure bill floating around now apparently there's not much infrastructure in this infrastructure bill but what better way to to rebuild american infrastructure to create great high paying jobs for for welders and 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 hvac folks and and uh guys cutting and ladies cutting uh, uh steel and and uh electronics i mean everything that goes into a, a modern warship or a modern commercial vessel and then the follow-on, the, the knock-on effects of that in the economy for the, the local uh, uh, suppliers and the, the hardware stores and real estate agents of, of buying homes for people that are gainfully employed with, with high-paying uh, jobs at the shipyards and, and the car dealerships selling trucks. I mean, the, 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 the good for our economy uh, of, of investing in the infrastructure of shipbuilding as part of this, this new bill, and I, I don't think there's much in there, uh, on this front would be just tremendous. So imagine of that 1.5 trillion, if we put 15 billion and match what the Chinese are doing, even over a five year, a short five year period, you know, well under a hundred billion dollars, what that would do for American shipbuilding 
and for the communities around those those uh, shipbuilding facilities, whether in Maine or along the Mississippi or on the West Coast, and again bipartisan, these are in, in red and blue states, and and we would have uh, you know just tremendous employment. Uh, it would be strategically you know, terrific for the country to have these additional ships, and you'd have communities that would be thriving because we invest in infrastructure. The same way, by the way, that the Chinese are doing. So, yeah. with the kind of money that's being spent right now, it, it'd be great if the uh, the administration could find some money uh, to put into the shipbuilding infrastructure. That would make a, a big difference for for the Navy, but also for our merchant shipping. Yeah, and you mentioned the communities around and, and Coast Guard, by the way, as well. I mean, we, don't, we don't want to leave the Coast Guard out. They, they, you know, when I was National Security Advisor, I used the the Coast Guard, or the President used the Coast Guard on a regular basis, like the Swiss Army knife. I mean, they're yeah. Uh, they're 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 not mentioned enough, and uh, they do you know just unbelievable work for the United States in keeping us safe. In addition to some of the, the humanitarian missions that they're more known for, but uh, there's a uh, there, there's hard power in the Coast Guard, and, and and they exercise it very well. So let me get back to the issue of of um, uh, of uh, sort of our vulnerability from an economic standpoint, and and we talked you you mentioned briefly the sort of the. Uh, the impact uh, in the in the pandemic uh, of of being you know d relying on uh, China for so much of what we needed, especially right at the at the beginning of the pandemic, um, it, it does strike me that we have a particular vulnerability if if the maritime logistics supply chain is completely uh, controlled uh, not by America but by the Chinese. Um, uh, it, it's not just a few select. Uh, products that we're, we're, we're nearshoring, which I think is extremely important. If you want to talk any, any further thoughts on that, we welcome those. But, but, but the means of, of transportation and, and logistics is controlled by China. It strikes me as an extremely vulnerable to position to be in, uh, whether you're in a military activation or not. Well, let's, let's think about it. We have uh, you know, American territory, CNMI, and American Samoa, and Guam. Uh, we've got American bases in, in Japan and Australia. Uh, we have the, you know, the, the, the best aircraft, the best men and women uh, using our platforms to protect us and our, and our friends and allies. But you know, imagine if we couldn't get uh, fuel and supplies and, and bullets and ammunition and, and missiles and er everything you need to operate you know, all, all of those, the, those platforms. Yeah, if we weren't able to, to resupply because there wasn't sufficient maritime lift assets, uh, that, that's, that's a huge problem in any future crisis, even if it's a crisis short of war. If there's a perception that the U.S. can't, uh, can't keep our folks supplied out in the Indo-Pacific, uh, that, that, again, creates a, uh, a real problem for policymakers. So we need to make sure that we have that sea lift capability. Uh, right now, it's getting very thin, and it's an area we need to invest in. There's, there's no question about it. And that's a wrap. Uh, Am Ambassador O'Brien, th thank you so much for being with us today. It's been so great to hear your thoughts and expertise on China and these matters of national security. That is all for this episode of the American Maritime Podcast. We thank you for tuning in and encourage you to share this podcast with others who share a love for and interest in American Maritime. I'm Mike Roberts, and this is the American Maritime Podcast signing off.